Welcome to the Real Vision Daily Briefing. It's Tuesday, June 28, 2022. I'm Ash Bennington, joined today by Andreas Steno Larson. Before we get to Andreas, let's take a quick look at U.S. equity markets. Uh, NASDAQ closing down. Looks like almost exactly 3% here on the day, uh, under 11,200, looks like 11,181 as that number bounces a little bit on the screen uh, at the closing bell. S&P 500 down over 2.0%, 2.01%, under 3,900, closing out the day at 3,822. Finally, Dow Jones Industrial Average, the best performer of the day, or the least worst, depending upon your perspective, minus one spot, 5.5%, closing under 31,000 at 30,951. Andreas, welcome back to Real Vision Daily Briefing. Thank you so much, Chess. Well, it's great to have you here, Andreas. I've been hanging out in crypto land uh, the last week or so. Bring us up to speed, big picture, what's happening right now? Well... I think once again, we've actually had this weird rally into the month end, um, in particular in equities. Uh, I've seen this uh, pattern unfold basically over the last uh, six or seven months in a row, uh, where we've had this um, material rally into month end. And right. right by the month end, we've had a slowdown again in equities. And I think that is exactly what's happening again. Yeah, uh, calling back uh, to last week, uh, looks like NASDAQ was up about 7%, S&P 500 up more than 6%, Dow Jones Industrial Average up more than 5%. But when you zoom the camera out, an ugly start to the year. I was reading an Edward Jones report this morning. Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of U.S. equities, we're down uh, 20% or thereabouts, depending upon the index, from the highs. Worst six months, first six months of the year since 19. 70, despite the gains we made last week. How do you think about it in the big picture? Well, I basically think that this is a, another bear market rally, uh, because if you look at the forward-looking indicators for the U.S. economy, they still look extremely bad. Uh, take, for example, the ISM manufacturing index. Uh, when I use my forward-looking model based on interest rates, uh, I basically expect the uh, manufacturing index to print maybe below 40 by uh, in this year. And we know that there is a strong correlation between this index and equities. So as long as the cyclical momentum in the U.S. economy is turning worse and worse by the month, you should basically still sell equities uh, on every rally. Yeah, let's take a look at the chart. I know we have a chart that you were looking at on the S&P. Let's pop that up. Perhaps you can walk us through. Yeah, uh, I mean, basically what you see is that every time uh, we get towards the uh, end of the month, we have these rebalancing flows uh, trying to push up the index. Uh, and what happens is basically that the usual let's say 60, 40 portfolios, they rebalance back towards equities because of the drop in equity indices. So exactly that happened again this month when equities drop, portfolio managers, they have to buy back equities to keep the allocation intact. But by the start of the new month, we see a bear market again. And this is a very strong pattern month after month currently. Yeah, so what you're talking about here are the rebalancing effects uh, that institutional mm. traders, institutional portfolio managers have to deal with, uh, basically just as a part of doing that job in terms of rebalancing, obviously has some feed through effects into markets more generally, hits retail traders and investors as well. Mm. Exactly. Uh, to be very practical, if you run a mandate with a let's say 60-40 split between equities and bonds, and equities are down uh, materially over the month, then you basically have to buy more equities to reflect the allocation mandate uh, that you have. And that is exactly what is happening every month and at the moment when we are stuck in this bear market channel. Uh, and I essentially expect it to continue through the autumn. 
Yeah, let's talk a little bit about another data point that came out today, fresh news. Uh, I'm talking here, of course, about Consumer Confidence Index. Uh, it looks like on the uh, this, this, this print is at 98.7. Uh, this is from a downwardly revised number of 103 spot two in May. Uh, this is obviously a, a, a dismal number, decade low. What's your thought on consumer confidence? Where are people getting the influence? Is this on the inflation side of the ledger? Uh, is this on the fear of recession or slowing growth side? What's your perspective on this, and what does it mean more broadly? Well, I think of, of it this way. When uh, you face negative real wages as a consumer, then you turn very negative on the outlook. And that is exactly what is happening at the moment. We see it across the globe, uh, maybe most materially in the US, but we also see it in Germany. We see it elsewhere. Uh, and I think the reason is that you basically face a cost pressure that you cannot cope with since uh, wages are not following uh, suit when it comes to inflation. Uh, and it's very, very simple in that regards. Households are simple. Uh, when you cannot pay the bills with the same kind of confidence as you could uh, in the month prior, then, of course, your confidence turns uh, more and more sour by the month. And I think usually you would expect uh, a correlation between the consumer confidence and unemployment rates, but with the time lag. So what we mm. usually see is that uh, consumer confidence drops, and then let's say six, nine months later, we start to see rising unemployment rates. And I basically expect the exact same pattern to unfold this time around, because I mean, right now, every, everything is being put to a stop. It's pretty visible when you uh, look across the various forward looking indicators we have for the US economy. Yeah. You know, talking of forward-looking indicators, uh, at Real Vision, we obviously live and breathe markets. One of the things that we've been talking about a little bit behind the scenes uh, here at Real Vision, a story that came out in the Wall Street Journal late yesterday afternoon uh, about the impact of rising rates and declining tech valuations on the convertible bond market. Uh, obviously, this is kind of an interesting one because they're hybrid securities uh, on the one hand, uh, like fixed income, on the other, like equity. Both sides of that ledger getting hammered uh, over the last several months. I'm wondering if you can give us a little bit of context on this. Uh, you know, it, it makes sense to see we're seeing costs of borrowing rise across the board, costs of capital for companies increasing, while meanwhile, their valuations are declining. Probably shouldn't be much of a surprise uh, that the initial issuance of convertible securities is in decline. But I'm curious, Andreas, how do you see this as more of a bellwether for markets? What does it mean for people who aren't in the convertible bond market? Well, I mean, first of all, let's uh, start with the definition of a convertible bond. It yeah. is basically a hybrid between equity and debt. Uh, and it is used by corporations when they are already very indebted and uh, when the market is extremely benign. So, I mean, through 2020 and 2021, we saw a lot of corporations issuing hybrids as a consequence of the very benign market. Um, right. And now we see a, a, an extremely bad pricing of these hybrids uh, because ultimately, uh, as a corporation, you're basically able to turn this into equity if you want to. Uh, and I think right now that there's a clear risk that a lot of corporations will actually turn this into equity. And, and once that happens, the entire market freezes uh, due to the risk of uh, other issues uh, following the same path. Uh, I know this uh, from my own professional life. Hybrids are trading in an extremely poor mood right now yeah. as a consequence of the risk of this being turned into equity. And that is not what investors want. And what does it signal, if anything, Andreas, from your perspective uh, about what's happening more broadly uh, in terms of credit conditions, in terms of the bond market, in terms of the cost of capital that companies are paying to finance their ongoing operations? Well, I guess this is the clearest signal that we can get that funding conditions 
are extremely tight right compared to two years ago right because uh, in late 2020 right about every corporation could issue a hybrid and the market would just buy those hybrids with an arm and a leg right and right now no one wants to uh, own a hybrid due to the uh, much tighter financial conditions due to the rise in interest rates etc so the alternative as a portfolio manager is just much better buying uh, senior unsecured bonds uh, stuff like that instead of buying hybrids so the pricing of hybrids is well it's basically just left the screen yeah, that's a, a grim prognosis indeed. Uh, switching gears here, another interesting story on the day. Kathy Wood uh, over at ARC saying the U.S. is already in recession. Of course, the official recession dating is done by NBER, the, uh, the dating agency that actually handles the official calls, uh, National Bureau of Economic Research. That's done ex post. It's done after we've had two quarters of consecutive mm. growth. Uh, but Kathy Wood coming out with this very bold statement, I suppose you could say, uh, saying, hey, look, uh, we all feel like we're in a recession. We're in a recession. What's your take on that? Well, I basically think she's right. Um, I brought a chart with me today showing the uh, running amount of Google activity uh, in terms of searches on the word recession. Uh, and we've basically hit a new all-time high in June. And I think it's a consequence of people... Uh, basically expecting things to turn very sour very soon. And the interesting thing here is uh, if you look at that time series history of uh, Google activity, every time we've had a spike in the uh, activity on Google uh, in terms of searches for recession, we've actually already been in a recession. So right. uh, I think the answer is yes. Uh, and the Fed is obviously yet to acknowledge that. Uh, the market is yet to acknowledge that. Uh, but I find it very likely. Yeah, it's an extremely interesting chart. You know, we've talked about the formal definition of recession here and the dating agency and all of that. But in reality, essentially what this chart tells you is when folks think they're in a recession for long enough and when they feel that strongly enough, we're generally in a recession. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Uh, and I mean, the, those uh, of you working in the private sector right now, you can probably feel it as well. Uh, I mean, right. in my professional life, it's very easy to feel that uh, everything is being paused. Uh, everyone is, is uncertain about what's going to happen over the next one, two quarters. And as soon as everybody sort of agrees that we need to take a step back and wait for something to happen, then obviously the recession arrives. Andreas, I want to move on and switch gears in just a second. But first, before we do, I know it's a jam-packed show. Any other charts that you wanted to show us? Well, I think it's really interesting to uh, watch the development in uh, commodity space. And uh, if we look at the price action over the past, say, two to three weeks, we have a, a couple of very interesting uh, price patterns to watch, in particular in uh, industrial commodities. If we look at the copper price, for example, um, I would uh, clearly say now that we are in a bear market for copper. Uh, we are also in a bear market for zinc. We are in a uh, bear market for uh, aluminum, etc. Uh, industrial metals linked to the manufacturing cycle, first of all. Uh, I but think this also is that for our producers to show that China. table. I think there's a table yeah. uh, that we have that shows some of these prices. Uh, if our producers want to show that right now as, uh, as Andreas is walking through. Exactly. Uh, and I think it's linked to both the slowdown that we see in the uh, manufacturing cycle globally, but also secondly to the recession in China. China is obviously in a recession already uh, due to the lockdown policies uh, related to COVID. And uh, I mean, everybody knows by now that China is a big consumer of these industrial metals. Uh, so, I mean, this is a signal to me that inflation is actually headed down now. We have bear markets in a lot of important commodities. And if I'm right that we are already on the verge of a recession or maybe even amidst one, then I would expect 
a landslide in commodities during the second half of, of the year. Yeah, I mean, that's a really grim table. I saw it earlier in the day, uh, and it really is a, just an impressively unpleasant look uh, at what's happened from peak uh, in fall 2022 in the commodities market. Uh, nickel down about 50%, obviously some unusual micro uh, economic dynamics there. But just looking down across that chart, this feels really broad based in terms of uh, what we see in industrial metals, uh, what we see in energy with nat gas. Uh, and Brent, uh, and some other significant double-digit 20-plus percent drops, about a fifth down from the top uh, in zinc, copper, and iron ore. Yeah, exactly. And to me, this is uh, kind of a confirmation that the market has started to price in the slowdown that we uh, will be faced with over the couple, uh, coming couple of quarters. So, I mean, every time we see a recession, every time we see a slowdown in global trade and every time we see a material slowdown in the construction sector in china we should also expect commodities to follow south and this is an important bellwether also for interest rates and for the central bank outlook during the uh, second half of the year you know, Andreas, continuing on with that very story, I want to take a look with a show uh, that we just released here on Real Vision today on 628. Uh, this is It's all about the business cycle. Uh, Michael Gaia, the Chief Investment Officer and Portfolio Manager at Terrasso Investments, hosted by Andreas Dennis Larson, uh, available on the Essential Plus and Pro Tier. Let's take a look because it speaks precisely to that point. You know, I, I, I use these one liners on Twitter and and one of the one-liners I used a lot for the Bitcoin community was when an investment becomes a religion, it's time to lose faith. Right? Because if you end up having this unrelenting belief and overconfidence in any particular investment theme, you could ultimately be right in the very long term, but that doesn't mean you're going to be right tomorrow. Right? People seem to have this fervor about them when they identify with an investment and kind of get into these echo chambers of cult-like behaviors as to why something is going to take over the world or why a theme is going to be the next major uh, thing to invest in. Mm. I started seeing a lot of that when it came to oil the last several months. I've done a number of these Twitter spaces. Everyone's talking about oil. There's a crisis coming. By the way, I agree with all this stuff, okay? But again, it's the path that matters more than the prediction of where oil is going to go. It's how it plays out between two endpoints. We got to a point where I think, you know, there was this uh, a hashtag trending at some point where it's about Canadian oil gang, right? So when I see that, my contrarian antennas go up because it suggests that there's this unbelievable belief that oil and commodities are going to keep running in the near term. And markets are funny in that they often humble uh, people that are overconfident. Mm. So from that perspective, you always have to think about the counter trade, right? Everybody uh, tries to predict the future, but nobody can predict the future in reality, okay? But if everyone's betting on a very particular future, the payout is always highest, betting against the crowd, right? Which is really at the core of what contrarianism is. Hmm. It seems very plausible to me. It seems very plausible to me that you have, you know, what could be a sizable correction in oil and commodities across the board. Lots of interesting points in that conversation uh, right now available on Real Vision on the Essential Plus and Pro Tier, all three tiers uh, on Real Vision's capital markets macro side. You know, really interesting points Michael Guy had made. I especially like his reference early in the clip uh, to the dangers when an investment becomes a religion. Uh, but more to the point here when we're talking about commodities, uh, he's talking about this as a contrarian call, a sizable correction uh, in oil and commodities, we should say, uh, closing out the day here, WTI, uh, 111 spot 71, uh, up uh, about 2% here on the day, 1 spot 953. Yeah, exactly. I mean, of course, the supply side is not going to save us on the energy front. We know that by now. But it is almost crystal clear by now that the Fed is trying to manufacture a slowdown in demand, and in particular, a slowdown in the demand for commodities. Uh, we know that Powell almost explicitly targets the price at the pump, so they want to see demand destruction in the commodity space. And I think that is exactly what is ongoing right now. We have demand destruction ongoing across the globe. Uh, we see it in forward-looking indicators. We see it in some of the more volatile uh, commodities, and we see it in live data. 
Uh, and by the end of the day, that is what is needed to bring the supply and demand curves back in check. Yeah. Uh, Andreas, lots of questions ripping in right now uh, from the Real Vision website, from the Exchange, our social media platform here at Real Vision, uh, and of course from YouTube. Uh, first question, uh, longtime viewer of ours, Bo Nito, wants to know Andreas, there's a lot of talk about a recessionary winter, and I'm in that camp, he mm. says. My question is at this point, is the correction slash recession, do you think it's going to be economic winter? Do you think it'll be mild, severe, or nuclear? <laughs> I hope that it won't turn into like a nuclear war at least. Uh, but by the end of the day, uh, I think the most likely scenario is a very swift but deep recession. Uh, and the reason why I say so is that uh, the move that we've seen in interest rates over the course of the past, say, two to three quarters is out of this world when you measure it in standard deviations. Uh, and that is important when the world is reliant on cheap funding uh, and uh, cheap debt in general. Uh, and uh, if you look at interest rate based models for growth uh, over the next, say, two to three quarters, they look extremely grim. Uh, I would argue that it's likely that we see manufacturing PMIs as low as 35 to 40 in uh, Q1 next year. Uh, but then I would also argue that it's likely that we see a material pivot from most global central banks. And uh, I guess in a year from now, we could basically uh, be back talking about QE, negative interest rates and all that due to the response from central banks to this slowdown. Yeah, by the way, Bonito added, Ash, before the show is over, please make sure Andreas takes a bow. He's a real player and a tremendous addition to the RV team. And of course, I agree completely uh, with that. So lots of new fans out here, Andreas. Um, here's a question from mm -hmm. Roger. I'm sorry, I think we had a little crosstalk on our connection there. But I wanted to move on to our next question. Uh, this is from Roger Bose from the Real Vision website. Uh, if you sell equities on every rally, how do you not run out of equities? <laughs> <laughs> That's a very fair question. I mean, uh, if you look at a typical portfolio, uh, let's take my own as an example. I'm usually invested in equities to the extent of, say, 70 to 80 percent of the portfolio when times are, are good. Right? Uh, and currently I'm trying to sell every time I find the price action to be interesting in that regards so close to month end i'm trying to bring down my uh, equity allocation and uh, find something else to invest in it's not easy right now uh, but i've allocated a bit towards gold i've allocated a bit towards tlt the long bond etf uh, basically just to protect myself uh, when when we are faced with this slowdown during the second half of the year yeah Here's a question uh, about Europe, uh, where you, of course, are currently located. It comes to us from mm. Ralph Humphrey uh, from the Real Vision website. Uh, does Andreas have any thoughts about Turkey getting over its objection to allowing Finland and Sweden into NATO? This obviously, of course, a late breaking story. Well, um, it is actually directly related to one single politician in the uh, Swedish parliament. Um, there is a Kurd in the uh, Swedish government and uh, Recep Erdogan is not fond of her, uh, and that is exactly why he's trying to block uh, Swedish membership of the uh, of the NATO alliance. Uh, and by the end of the day, I think what will happen is that Sweden will cave in uh, on this particular topic and uh, basically allow Erdogan to get his uh, wish, and uh, both Finland and uh, Sweden will join NATO. I'm very certain about that. I live just on the border of Sweden. Um, and this, of course, is a hot potato politically. Uh, but very interesting that it, it's all down to one politician uh, from the uh, current part of, of Turkey. And Erdogan is very much against her. It is interesting, obviously, as we talk of these sort of big macro focus stories that it can come down uh, in the end to these critical issues to just uh, a matter of personalities, one individual on one side or the other uh, who mm -hmm. has an objection to a particular policy course. 
uh, can have that impact that really changes things, which is one of the reasons why uh, we need to watch this so closely and why we're so happy that you are joining us uh, from Europe to have uh, your insights on all of these conversations. Switching gears here, uh, this one comes to us from Tim New York from the Real Vision website. Uh, HYG uh, junk bonds, I should say, for those who aren't familiar, uh, it's the iShares uh, iBox high yield corporate bond ETF that, uh, that Tim is referencing here. HYG junk bond markets, thoughts on the sector and where this can drop to when a market rolls over and then he adds cheers i don't know he sounds british he might maybe he's a brit here in new york tim new york <laughs> cheers cheers sounds very british to me love it uh, i mean if you look at the uh, high yield sector uh, i consider it very correlated to the equity market in general uh, so when i have a bearish view on uh, the index level on equities i also hold a bearish view on uh, corporate bonds and maybe in particular uh, the high yield sector. The reason is that we don't have the backing of central banks any longer. Um, the marginal buyer is gone. And with inflation running uh, close to double the, the territory across the globe, it's very tricky uh, to find a good argument to buy corporate bonds at current yield levels. Uh, so currently, it's almost like uh, catching a falling knife to buy, th buy these bonds. Yeah. Andreas, we've gotten through a number of questions here. Uh, I wanted to allow you some time at the end to frame out your thesis, final thoughts, key takeaways that you'd like to leave our viewers with, you'd like to leave our listeners with. How are you thinking about this going forward? Well, I feel very certain that we are at least on the verge of a recession. Um, the final confirmation is that uh, everybody is searching uh, for the word recession on Google because it essentially means that everybody is planning for it. Uh, and as soon as everyone's talking about it, every, everyone's discussing it in, in uh, meeting rooms, uh, all the executives are debating how to deal with it, then basically everything comes to a standstill for, for a couple of quarters. And I think we need to grow accustomed uh, to that thought. Uh, Q3, Q4 will turn into negative quarters for growth. It will turn into negative quarters for equities, credit markets, most asset classes, basically. But hopefully, it will also kill inflation. Yeah, I wanted to ask you actually about that as we close here on the day, what you think of inflation, what your big picture thesis is, uh, and how you'd like mm. to leave viewers with thoughts on that particular topic. Well, to be honest, I've tried to call the peak a couple of times already during the spring, uh, not with a lot of success, but uh, I think more and more evidence points to the fact that uh, below the surface, the inflation pressure is clearly abating now. Uh, if you look at inflation expectations traded in markets, uh, that they've basically traded down since uh, March or April. Uh, if you look at bond yields, we've uh, basically seen, I guess, the peak in momentum in uh, in long bond yields. Uh, and uh, below the surface, we, we see a material building of inventories uh, in corporations, uh, which to me is a signal that demand is uh, waning fast now. And we know that when demand slows aggressively, ultimately the price needs to adjust in a negative direction. And right. by the end of the day, it is exactly what we need by now, a, uh, an adjustment of the demand side to bring prices down. Yeah, this is the thesis that the cause uh, and effect and cure of high prices is high prices. In other words, hmm. high prices create lower prices because the demand destruction that accompanies them. Uh, you've talked about uh, how challenging it is to get right. Uh, we should probably add that markets have gotten this wrong. They've underpriced inflation risk uh, in the uh, in the past. And uh, so while we see some of those signs abating, it's tough to know exactly what's going to happen next. We're still at the high on CPI, 8.6%. Exactly. And I mean, one lesson to be learned is that both central banks and markets, they underprice the development in inflation, both on the way up, but also on the way down. And I think that's what's going to happen over the next couple of quarters. Andreas, this was a lot of fun. We need to do it more often, man. Absolutely, Ash. <laughs> Thank you very much for joining us. My pleasure.
And thanks again for watching the Real Vision Daily Briefing. Tomorrow, Andreas Stenel Larsen will be back, this time hosting Darius Dale. Have a good night, everybody.